Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus. This is a podcast style show where we cover one topic each week and we get really into it. This week we're talking about gender identity. It's a really important topic. We're talking about terms used to describe gender. We're talking about what gender is, why it matters in the science of it, and that's what we're getting to today. What is the science saying about gender identity? Gender is something that is taught to us. It's not something that we are born with. Gender is taught to us from the moment we are born. They give us, you know, little hats, little blue or pink hats, little blankets. And a lot of people make it uncomfortable to talk about because some people are uncomfortable discussing why they are how they are. It's really hard to get that kind of self-awareness. But it affects everything that we do. So think about it. Pink for boys, blue for girls, right? Think about it. Did I say that right? Should it be the other way around? Blue for boys, pink for girls? Does that make more sense? It really doesn't. And in fact, in the Women's Journal in the early 1900s, pink was a more decided and stronger color, is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. That was written in the Women's Journal, early 1900s. These things change over time. Culture determines gender. And a 2010 study of transgender people said that they knew their gender identity by age five. So to imply, as some do occasionally, that transgender is a new thing, it's not new. We're just slowly starting to understand it. Gender is put upon us, and the fluidity of that gender is because we grow and we age and we change. So we have the biological gender, we've got gender identity, which includes transgender, we've got gender roles, those are very important for a lot of different reasons, but they're also not important. <laughs> sexual orientation, which includes heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, asexual, all of those are part of the fluidity of our gender. So let's break this down scientifically. While you're in the womb, every fetus is a female. They all start that way. The Y chromosome is added at the right time, which makes the body present as male. But even then, sometimes things don't develop properly. The clitoris comes from the same fetal tissue as a penis. It's called a homologous organ, which means that sometimes the clitoris is oversized and sometimes the penis is dramatically undersized. And that happens. It happens fairly often. Sometimes both exist, which is a hermaphrodite or an intersex situation. This happens quite often. Some animals, not really humans, but some animals are gynadromorphs, which is some cells are male and some cells are female. It sometimes will manifest as, say, a bird that's half one color and half another color. Hyenas, also something from the animal world, their clitoris is sometimes called a protopenis, again, illustrating that these are homologous organs. The protopenis on a hyena can actually get an erection, they can have sex with it. These are female hyenas and they can even urinate through it. So to imply that sex or gender is fixed and always the same is wrong because things change and nature is never 100%. We know that gender isn't tied to physicality because we've seen it in human populations. Gender roles, which I mentioned earlier, are important because it helps us define what we are supposed to be doing in society, but they're also not important because they are societal creations. Gender roles can hurt people. Boys can only be strong action heroes, only, even if they don't like that. Think of you know, movies like Billy Elliot, where he wanted, to, he wanted to dance, and he was considered somehow less manly by people in this story. It hurt sucks. Girls can only be housewives and homemakers. These are gender roles that people have. You know, girls must wear shoes which crush their feet, undergarments which cover because modesty, and support in specific ways that may actually be damaging to the girls' bodies. But they have to do this because gender roles say they have to do this. Gender roles are important, but not important. Not that important. Examples like these are real. You know, men must work all day, support the family. They should never emote. They should never express feelings. Those hurt people. It makes people 
not live a life that they want. And in the end, it's all bull anyway. The gender spectrum is another important part of science. It's been studied a long time in psychology. Uh, the gender spectrum, as it was once called, was a spectrum from feminine to masculine, a line that everyone fell on. But there's way more than that. No one is 100% feminine, no one's 100% masculine, but the BEM sex role inventory, or BSRI, was a flawed measure and a way to determine whether you were masculine or feminine or somewhere in between, which was called androgynous. And if you didn't fall anywhere on there, you were called undifferentiated. It's bad, because this does not grasp all of the complexity and nuance of gender. Because we're assuming that there's only, one, there's only two right answers and everything else is sort of in between. Better and a more modern way of looking at this is a gender continuum. Because people will change over their lives, they'll identify with different things at different times. There are a lot of different gender definitions. Agender, or neutral, with no gender. Androgynous, which is many genders. Bigender, which is two genders that are combined. Cisgender, which means you identify with the sexual parts that you have that you were born with. Gender queer, which means that you're kind of figuring it out still, like gender fluid or gender questioning. There are all these different terms, more and more and more of them. And they're all important in the gender continuum. And it's confusing. It's really confusing, but it's valuable because how we identify is important and it's unique to each person and it's going to change throughout your life. You may be born and believe yourself to be cisgender or agender and then later in your life become more androgynous and then even later in your life become gender questioning and not really sure where you lie. There's, this is completely normal. We grow and we change. Some people may want a little more science than psychology. I know it gets some flack. So they looked at gender in the brains of rats. They added an enzyme called estradiol, and that inhibited DNA methyltransferase, which is to say it changed their DNA just a little bit, or it inhibited a way that DNA naturally changes. This caused a change in the gender of these rats. Now, they didn't go interview them, they observed them. So physically, these rats were female, say the, say the uh, researchers, but in their reproductive behavior, they behaved as males. That's the closest we can get to observing a gender change in animals. But if you look even further, their brains also structurally transformed. And this was after the sexual differentiation period had ended. So say, like rat puberty. Normally, that's when sexual differentiation would blossom. However, after that, it's thought to be set. And it turns out you can affect gender in rats by adding this enzyme. To bring it to humans, gender also exists in our brains. MRI scans of transgender people who were in transition from male to female were compared to those of cis males and cis females. And the brains of the transitioned women were more akin to the gender that they transitioned to than the one that they were assigned at birth. That is to say, they were born male, transitioned to female, and when they scanned their brains, their brains also looked female. Gender is real. It's important, and it can be fluid, and it also cannot be fluid. But talking about it is really hard. So to find out more about that, come back to Test Tube Plus tomorrow. You can subscribe so you get all of our videos right in your inbox. And if you don't want to wait until then, make sure you check out last week's episodes all about aliens. It's pretty exciting stuff. And we had our first guest, Dr. Ian O'Neill, astrophysicist. It was really cool. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.